So, um, unlike, uh, unlike Mark, I accept my invitations to stream app. And I, I mean, so I'm, the last time I was here was in 2019, and I uh, talked about the same subject back then. And so I today provide an update. But first, I have to remind what I said on the previous occasion. And so let me, um, I will tell you what is, uh, the, the title was Exercises in Skein Valued Curve Counting. So first I explain skein, then I explain uh, curve counting, and then I do the exercises. So let me start with the skein. So I, I'm going to write some formulas. And then I will explain what they mean. So these are the skein relations. They come from the study of um, this kind of quantum invariance of three manifolds and knots. And uh, the, uh, the skein, if I have a, um, a three manifold oriented, then the skein of M is a certain um, uh, module. And uh, it's given by framed links in M Uh, modulo, um, maybe it's the free algebra, the free vector space with basis, frame, links, and M um, over, uh, let's say, a Q, um, uh, A, Z, something like that, uh, divided by uh, these relations. And what these relations mean is that uh, if you see three knots or two knots which look the same everywhere but locally like these pictures, then you impose this relation. Okay, so that's, that's what it is. That, that's the skein. And let me tell you uh, two facts about the skein. Uh, the first is that the skein of the three sphere, uh, this is um, uh, just the ground ring. Um, and uh, under the, um, the, the map takes the empty link to one. And uh, the fact that this is true is uh, more or less the same as the existence of the Homfley polynomial. Because once you, um, once you know this fact, you take any link you want, you send it over there, you get something, that's Homfley polynomial. Okay. Or another way to say it is that uh, this statement means that any length that you have, you, you use these relations, uh, relations enough, eventually you get rid of the link entirely using this one, and then you're left with number, and that's Homfley polynomial. Okay, so that, that's one fact I wanted to tell you about the skein, and the other fact is that the skein of a circle times a disk, um, uh, this thing is uh, a free with basis given by pairs of partitions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the way, um, uh, the best way to think about this is if you have the uh, kind of S1 times D2, kind of solid donut, a thing you can do to it is you can add from the outside a curve which looks like this, okay? And um, uh, there's a, it is uniquely determines a basis by uh, asking that it be diagonal with respect to this operator. So there's a basis which diagonalizes this operator, and that basis is just the basis of the, of the Wilson, I mean, so I said there's some connection to, uh, to this kind of physics, and if you know it, you know what the Wilson lines and church simons theory are, and the basis corresponds to the basis of Wilson lines in some representation. And th th this, fact, th this fact here is more or less due to Turayev. So, so th th this fact is due to the 
people who came up with Humphrey polynomial. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that, that's about the skein. And um, now I want to talk about curve, so that, that, that just keep that. Uh, I want to talk about curve counting. So this begins somewhere different. It begins with a, um, a Calabial 3x, Calabial 3-fold, and I allow myself a boundary condition. This is Lagrangian. And I ask that it satisfy the analog of the, so, you know, for Calabial, you ask churn class vanishes. For Lagrangian, you ask an analogous condition, which is called being Maslov 0. It's just the analog, the analog of being Calabial. Okay, so, so we uh, study some such thing, and um, we consider maps from a Riemann surface with boundary to um, uh, XL. Uh, so, and um, uh, uh, to begin with, one wants to try and study holomorphic maps. And there are a few facts about this problem that are important to know. Um, the first one is that the kind of expected dimension of the space of such maps, which you uh, learn from some index calculation, is zero. So the expected dimension is zero. This is some, uh, some incarnation of why string theorists like Calabria 3. Okay. And then the, uh, the next important point about this thing is that um, the, the moduli space of such maps is non-compact, but uh, Gromov long ago explained how to compactify it. Uh, so, so, you, um, so it admits, uh, it admits this kind of Gromov compactification. And um, so once you have something which is compact in dimension zero, uh, you may think, well, if it was honestly dimension zero, it would just be a bunch of points and you can count them and you would be in business to define some numbers. But um, this word expected means that the equation which cuts the holomorphic ones out of the space of all ones is not transverse, and you have to perturb to make it uh, transverse. You perturb to make this well-defined. Perturb holomorphic curve equation. to uh, get zero-dimensional moduli space. So that you can count. And there is an enormous amount of mathematics involved in this uh, perturbing, which I won't begin to try and cite here. But it's been the work of many people for a very long time. But uh, once you have done this, uh, once you have done such a perturbation and gotten a count, you may like to know that uh, two different perturbations gave you the same answer. Okay, so you have you have your perturbation, uh, maybe C1 and C2. You have one parameter family of these perturbations. And you have your moduli space, MC1, MC2. And you have uh, this kind of moduli space here, and this moduli space here. And then you can consider the moduli space of solutions as you vary the perturbation. And because you've perturbed to make things transverse, some smooth one manifold, um, and uh, which everything is good unless it happens something like this. If, if this kind of thing didn't happen, which does not happen in the closed gromov witten theory when there is no Lagrangian, then you would know that the count on one side, at least with signs, is equal to the count on the other side because the whole thing is a boundary of a one-manifold, hence zero. And so you learn inequality. But it turns out that when you allow a Lagrangian a boundary condition, then you will find some families which just stop. So I want to now discuss um, uh, uh, which families, uh, how, how this problem occurs. Okay, so, we're good. Um, So, um, uh, th there is basically uh, two things which cause problem. Um, the, the first one, um, 
uh, looks like this. So, so I'll draw, I'm drawing a curve which ends on the Lagrangian. And I'll draw the boundary of the curve in white and the interior of the curve in green. Okay, and I'm, I'm considering a one-parameter family as I vary the perturbation. And what can happen in a one-parameter family is that uh, the distance um, that you travel along this, uh, any particular path, but for example, this path, the distance you travel along this path along the curve can go to zero. And if that happens, uh, you wind up with this, um, this kind of thing. And uh, this kind of thing, uh, and this, this is a problem, your modulized space has stopped, even though your space of parameters is continuing. So, so this is one, uh, one family of geometries which can occur as you, as you vary perturbation. That's, uh, that's one problem. And the other problem, uh, similar. The other problem is you um, have some kind of curve. Ah, uh, I promised I would draw the boundary in white and the inside in green. Just leave it aside. You have some kind of curve, and now the boundary can shrink as well. So it can happen that the boundary shrinks to a point. And so then kind of modulized space stops here. Maybe, maybe I'll draw the Lagrangian. Kind of in. Orange. Even though the parameter space maybe continues. Okay, so this, uh, th these two problems mean that when you try and count uh, holomorphic curves with boundary in one parameter families, um, yeah, that then then some kind of problem. And so there's been various uh, uh, solutions to this problem in genus uh, zero. Um, kind of Fukaya's great body of work gives you one kind of solution. And I'm, I now discuss different kind of solution in, in higher genus. So uh, what to do? Well, um, you look at this curve, and you, uh, in this one, it is a singular in embedding of a singular curve which appears at the boundary of moduli space. But the same picture, it has also a different meaning. It also means the immersion of a smooth curve. So this is just a cylinder now. Um, which can happen in the interior of the moduli space. And this one, unlike this one, it's finished deforming, but unlike but with this one, it deforms smooth, uh, smoothly. And what happens with this one, um, it looks a bit like this. So it, so I, I mean, the, the, it, we're in three dimensions, and the, the, the boundary is a curve, you know, there's, there's, there's one manifold, in a, uh, inside of a three manifold, so you expect it to meet itself um, in co-dimension one. Okay, so uh, as you deform, it looks like this. Um. So it, I, I have this cylinder, uh, I, I'm kind of uh, varying parameters, and at some moment, the boundaries of the cylinder meet, then they cross each other, and I wind up with that kind of uh, self-linked cylinder. Okay. And so what you, um, what you, what you uh, if, if you look at this picture, and you look closely, and closely means um, at this region, Then you will see that the three uh, different boundaries of the curve are the three terms of this uh, skein relation. You have to, um, uh, to really see it, you would have to uh, take, uh, take them all and add kind of an, an uh, you have to add to all of them this kind of thing like this, add that to all three of them, and unwind it and rearrange it, you'll see this equation, except for the z. Uh, the z um, in this curve counting story, it will appear because this guy has Euler characteristic one less than this guy. And so if I count everyone 
by uh, uh, z to minus the Euler characteristic, then I get exactly the, the, the difference between this side and this side is the skein relation. So in other words, um, uh, this curve counting, uh, I ran into a problem here, and the problem was that four is not equal to five or something. But uh, if instead of count, trying to count as numbers, I count the curves by their boundary in the, in the skein, um, uh, the kind of, uh, this kind of wall crossing is exactly canceled by the skein relation. Okay, so that, that, that cures the first problem. A second problem, um, you can try to do a similar thing. Yeah, so uh, you can try to do a similar thing, which is uh, you look at this guy, and you say he too uh, could mean something else. He could mean a torus, which by accident, uh, so I mean right now he means a torus with one boundary puncture, where the boundary puncture has length zero. But he could also mean a torus which by accident uh, at one point hit the Lagrangian. And if I take that point of view instead, uh, again, it deforms freely in a, in a family. So um, there's this kind of singular moment where this guy uh, hits here. But um, uh, he, could, uh, he could go up and he could go down. Somehow he can, um, yeah. And so again, um, uh, uh, this, this one has an intersection. Um, so uh, uh, here the intersection is a circle. Um, here there is no intersection. Uh, so so the, these got, this is two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. Generically, they should not meet. They'll meet in co-dimension one in a family. Um, So if I, if I try and play the same game, um, uh, this one, um, okay, um, you know, uh, uh, this uh, might start to look a lot like this, and indeed the Z will appear for this genus reason, but uh, how do I get the A minus A inverse? Um, from the point of view of counting these guys by the, how they intersect this, um, this thing, uh, I would be instructed to count them both as zero whereas the empty knot. And so it wouldn't help me any. And um, the, the solution to this is you ask what changes in this family. And so I said this is two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and a six-dimensional space. And when you have things whose dimensions add up to one less than the ambient dimension, they don't intersect, but they might have linking number. And so what you can expect to change uh, in here is linking number, and so I introduce um, something to capture the linking number. So, and uh, how do you capture linking number? You have to, um, in the most down-to-earth way, is you say one of these things is the boundary of something, and you intersect the other one with that something. Okay, so I introduce some uh, four-dimensional guy, the four-dimensional thing, and actually I introduce two of them. And uh, uh, the two of them, they're kind of oriented oppositely. And you can set it up so that the, um, uh, the kind of intersection number uh, changes by, uh, well, two, because I've put two of them. So uh, if I record everyone not only by um, z to the Euler characteristic, which I continue to do, but also by a to the uh, intersection number with this four chain. So, uh, intersection with chain. Um, then uh, uh, this, uh, this wall crossing is also, um, you know, it would cause a problem, but if you impose this, if you count things by their boundary and you impose the skein relation, then it, it cancels this, uh, uh, this wall crossing as well. But um, uh, this, uh, I've cured one problem, but unfortunately introduced another.
And the new problem which is introduced is that, so if I'm going to count things by their intersection with this four chain, I better also do that to this guy. Okay? And if I'm going to uh, try and define a linking number of um, someone which ends on something with that thing, I mean, I'm going to run into trouble. And the kind of trouble I'm going to run into is that, uh, is the following. So I have, um, okay, let's just put this one again. And I put now this for a chain. Okay. And uh, I could have an intersection of the four chain and this curve. Um, maybe, uh, maybe here. And in a one parameter family, this thing could go to the boundary and fall off. And that would mean my count is not well defined. Right, like how I count, which power of A I counted with, not well defined. And so, um, okay, well, let's see what happens. I have the one where it, I have the, the, the one where it's at the boundary. And then I have the one where it's fallen off entirely. Um, it's gone now. Uh, and so uh, it may, this may trouble you because I've instructed you to count this one by A and that one by nothing. And so that would break my invariance of counting. And so I have to now say one more word about this four chain, which is that um, it, it, I choose it to have the following geometry, which is that I, I pick at the beginning of time some vector field on the Lagrangian. So I'm going to call this a port chain, uh, it's called W, and I'll call this, uh, this guy V. And I uh, demand, you know, when you count holomorphic curves, you need complex structure. And so I demand that um, this uh, J, complex structure J uh, applied to V is somehow uh, spans uh, this direction of W. Um, contained W. Okay. And uh, uh, this has the following effect. It means, so, so um, I can use now this vector field. So generically, a vector field uh, will be nowhere tangent to a, um, this kind of circle. But in a one parameter family, of course, you can acquire such a tangency. And uh, since I impose this condition, um, well, having this vector field tangent to the, uh, what does it mean this vector field is tangent to this circle? It means that, uh, well, J time, since this guy is holomorphic, J times the vector field also tangent to it. In other words, there's an intersection of W with uh, this person exactly at the boundary. Okay, so this, um, uh, uh, imposing this condition means that at this moment, the vector field is, is, is tangent. And uh, therefore, if I use this vector field to give a framing to the knot, then this change in intersection number exactly compensates the change in framing. Okay, and that is the third scale innovation. So, um, maybe a theorem. And this theorem is with Tobias Ekholm. And we have finally, after five years, finished putting the kind of, uh, all the foundations to Purvis in, in, in general. And the theorem is that, um, uh, I just say it informally, this works. If you count curves um, by z to minor, minus Euler characteristic, a to the intersection with the Fourier chain, class of the boundary in the skein, well defined. This gives an invariant count valued in the skein. So um, let me mention uh, that, of course, a paper of Edward Witten in 1992, in some sense, predicts this theorem, but I am confused about how uh, precisely and what the precise relationship is. 
So let me, uh, I, let, let me formulate uh, some questions about this. Um, I wrote down what my questions were. Yeah, so um, the, the first question is that in, in Witten's paper, uh, the comparison between Chern Simon's theory and the holomorphic curve counting, it happened, as, as far as I understood, at the level of the action and the path integral. Whereas this comparison is happening somewhere else. It's happening uh, in the moduli space of holomorphic curves. So I, I, uh, the first question is, what is the relation between those two things? Second thing I'm confused about is that in Witten's paper, churn simons appeared by studying uh, the degenerate curves and how they contributed. And also, Witten got out the kind of um, the, the churn simons invariant of the three-manifold. Neither of those things are anywhere to be seen in this picture. In fact, uh, something we do, I mean, it's kind of consistent with something we do in the foundations which is what we have to prove is related to the fact that we can exclude degenerate contributions entirely. So there's a, uh, there's a fourth degeneration that could happen where a degenerate contribution of higher genus breaks off at the boundary. And what we prove there is you can perturb things in such a way this never happens. So that, that may be somehow related. The next thing is that uh, 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 what is this four chain? So in, as far as I understood, in Witten's account and then the uh, accounts in, in the string theory literature afterwards, um, uh, they must have some, you guys must have some other way than this uh, of, of finding this framing and dealing with this kind of crossing. Um, so it's, it's a mystery to me uh, what exactly is this four chain. Another mystery, maybe related, is that this A, I mean here, in Witten's paper, um, there's some like brain here. And in particular, the amount of brains has some meaning. And there's like some SLN, Chern Simon theory for definite N. And uh, no N has appeared in this story. Okay, and uh, this, this A, it, it appears kind of formally. So it's a related mystery. Um, and then the last, uh, the last mystery I want to mention about this, uh, mystery to me, it may be well known uh, to people in the audience. Uh, is um, this, this, uh, this kind of reasoning. Um, what is the analog of that? In, I mean, in like, like, for example, if this reasoning is correct, it must descend from some reasoning in actual string theory. And if it is like in the topological world. And like, what, what is that reasoning? And I've seen things kind of vaguely reminiscent in this kind of papers about background independence and so on, but I don't know how to pin it down. Okay, so those are my... Uh, I always ask a lot of questions, and these are my questions uh, during my talk. Uh, questions for you. Okay, so that was, um, that was the skein-valued curve counting, but I promised today examples in skein-valued curve counting. So now I will do, exam do the examples. So okay, we don't need the skein relation anymore. So the first example is, um, is related to something which uh, Aguri and Vafa discovered long ago. Um, so, so this is related to this example, example one. And it's related to this uh, work of Aguri and Vafa from long ago about not invariance of topological strings. So they, they uh, predicted or proved, depending on what kind of person you are, that if you want to study the Homfle, the Homfle polynomial of a knot and also the colored, uh, its colored variants are given by uh, uh, counting curves on some Lagrangian and the resolved conifold. So now I give mathematical proof of this statement. So you begin in um, at T star S3. And in T star S3, uh, so this is, supposed to be T star S3. And you have zero section, there's some uh, S3. And uh, uh, I, I pick some knot that I want to study. Some, some knot I want to study. Maybe my, my picture has too many dimensions. So let's, let's draw one dimension less. T star S3. 
and I pick some knot that I want to study, k, and I consider the co-normal to k. And um, uh, this S3 and this K, they intersect in a circle which has Euler characteristic zero, so their intersection number is, is zero, and you expect you can push one off the other. In fact, you can. And so now this is kind of some N star K kind of uh, pushed off a little bit, so I'll call it N star epsilon K. And uh, let me count holomorphic curves in this geometry. Um, it turns out not to be very hard, there's one. And this one holomorphic curve, it's, uh, if you set things up right, it's exactly the path traced by this uh, knot as I push one of these guys off the other one. So, so you can arrange for that to be true. Okay, so the, the curve count is one, one holomorphic curve. But uh, remember, I count these curves in a, a new kind of way. I count this one holomorphic curve by its boundary in the skein module. So this one is one times its boundary here, which turns out to be the uh, longitude, so, so the co-normal to the knot, topologically it's a solid torus, and its boundary here is the longitude of that solid torus. And this thing we're not gonna mess with. And, uh, it, well, its boundary here is just K itself. And so now, um, well, that wasn't very interesting, but I'll do a move uh, that in symplectic geometry is called stretching. And uh, I'm very curious uh, how this move, it's another question for you guys, uh, how is this move related to things in physics? Um, like, like uh, we'll, I'll discuss in a second more precise version of this question. So uh, I, I consider a small neighborhood of this three sphere, smaller than this epsilon. And uh, so I have, a, I have the co-sphere co bundle around the three-sphere. And I degenerate the metric there. And uh, so this is a well-studied operation in symplectic geometry. And what happens when you do it is, uh, I think people have in this conference before talked about this operation, but just an algebraic geometry version. This is the thing where you have this like uh, expanded degeneration and so on. So uh, uh, this operation, uh, after you do it, you have a kind of copy of the uh, cotangent bundle of S3 downstairs, and inside there you have the zero section, and then you have a copy of the kind of um, uh, cosphere bundle of S3 times R, and in here you have this uh, N epsilon, this N conormal decay, and the theorem that people prove in symplectic geometry is some version of the statement that if you count holomorphic curves here, uh, it's the same as counting some kind of configurations of holomorphic curves in here, where you, uh, you can have curves that do this kind of thing. So just they, like, they can live on one side, they can live on the other side, they can go from one side to the other side. But the things you have to know about, this is what they could do in general. But the thing you have to know about this is that when they cross, oh, um, um, wherever they cross, it has to be along something called um, a, a, rabe, a rabe orbit. So uh, kind of in this kind of, uh, this boundary it has, it has a natural vector field on it called ray vector field, and it needs to be orbit of this vector field. And it needs to be, for dimension reasons, a ray orbit of index zero. Okay, so th th this would be in general uh, if I was doing some other geometry. Uh, however, what happens here is that, okay, first of all, um, now, I've drawn a bunch of people who are actually illegal. Um, uh, this guy is illegal because the zero section of the cotangent bundle is exact and no holomorphic curve can end on an exact Lagrangian. So this one doesn't happen. Okay, so none of that. Um, and in fact, uh, T star S S3 has the property that it has no rave orbits of index zero. 
This is related to the fact that uh, S3 is kind of round sphere, you know, uh, uh, so somehow like the, the, the index of this ray orbit is the same as the index of the corresponding geodesic. Um, so, so ray orbits for like metric is just same as geodesics more or less. An index of ray orbit, same as index of geodesic, and the geodesics of the round sphere all common family, so index minimum, minimum is something like two. Anyway, there are no such things. And what that means is that after you do this stretching, all the curves that you count uh, live here. They could have had genus also. Okay, so they live here. Um, and so let us count them. So, so the count, uh, the curve count here is uh, a sum, again. And by the way, I'm only, uh, I should have said this. I'm only going to, when I said there was one curve here, um, what I meant was there's one curve that, so to speak, goes one time around. I fixed a homology class in which I study the curve. And so I'm going to keep that homology class fixed throughout this discussion. So on this side, again, you have some sum. So this is curve count is some sum, and this the thing I said about keeping the homology class fixed, it's one n star k yeah. tensor. Um, uh, well, the curves don't end here. Okay, so tensor empty set. And so it's some sum over all curves. I count them um, by some a to something, z to something, then this thing. So, okay, well, this thing is always the same. So this thing is some, some curve count. But curve count times L times empty. And uh, by this argument I just gave, this was a deformation invariance argument. So I have, uh, I have proven that these things are equal. And well, I have here one LK, and here I have some mystery number, L empty set. But I told you that that's the definition of the Homfleet polynomial. If I take K and I write it as something times empty, then this something must be Homfleet polynomial. So, th so this is a proof of this Aguri Vafa uh, statement. Okay, that was example, that was example one. Um, and more precisely, it's a proof of the kind of um, lowest order term in this Aguri Vafa prediction. Uh, okay, so the next example, so example two. Uh, this is um, related to a paper of Aganagic and Vafa in 2000, and also related to some uh, math papers by uh, uh, kind of a little bit later of Katz and Liu and uh, Graeber and Zaslow. Again, the precise relation is not entirely clear. Uh, this concerned the following question. Uh, you take C3, and you take this kind of Harvey Lawson Lagrangian. And that is the thing which, uh, in some kind of toric diagram for C3, uh, people draw like this. Okay, so, so, so this one. And you want to count uh, holomorphic curves ending on this guy. So you want to count uh, th this kind of stuff. So uh, let me do it. Um, I'm going to do it again by some kind of stretching argument like before. But, but this time, I stretch in a bit different place. Instead of stretching uh, to separate the Lagrangian, here this time is only one Lagrangian. And instead of stretching to separate the Lagrangian uh, from the other Lagrangian, I'll uh, break the Lagrangian itself. So, so this time, I have uh, kind of a C3. And then I have some kind of Lagrangian L. And um, I'm just going to uh, uh, stretch around some sphere, OK? Some, so, 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 some kind of sphere uh, of large radius. And when I do that, um, I have now some C3 and some S5 times R. And in here, I have this Lagrangian. This has the topology of a two torus times R. 
And uh, this, again, is this is the original Arenagic Rafa uh, guy. Okay, and um, uh, uh, this time, um, so it's not, it's not so helpful to uh, try and study the curve count directly with this breaking, because of course what happens is they just all go here and you learn nothing. So I'm going to do something else. Um, I'm going to study, uh, when I have a Lagrangian in the game, you can have holomorphic curves which go off to infinity and asymptotic to something what's called a Rabe chord of Lagrangian. And so there, it so happens, there's a Rabe chord here of index one. And I will study the moduli space of curves uh, which kind of go up to this Rabe chord, travel along the Lagrangian, go right out here, uh, moduli space of such curves. Cur holomorphic curves whose boundary, holomorphic curves with one puncture, with a boundary, with a puncture, whose puncture goes up here, the boundary puncture, and the boundary travels along the Lagrangian. And similar kind of index calculation tells you that this moduli space, so um, uh, let's call this red chord row, and the moduli space M of row. So uh, index calculation tells you that the dimension of this moduli space is one, and I can study its boundary. And in this business of Fourier theory, uh, always the way we learn things, we look at the boundaries of moduli space. So that's what I do here. Uh, I study this boundary, and um, when, uh, uh, well, what is it? Well, uh, there's two kinds of things which can happen. One thing which can happen is uh, this kind of boundary breaking, which we discussed before. And that boundary breaking, as I've uh, already explained, it's canceled, it's all canceled by counting in the skein. So if I do the skein valued count of the boundary of this moduli space, the contributions from boundary break breaking contribute zero. But there's another bound, it turns out there's another boundary contribution, and that has to do with kind of when stuff runs off to infinity. Okay, that's, a, that's another boundary of this moduli space. And what that boundary looks like, this is kind of, kind of well-established stuff in symplectic geometry literature, that boundary looks like, it's similar to the discussion from before, um, in principle, you have holomorphic curves which look like this, and they do whatever they want in here, and then whatever they want in here, whatever, okay, and then maybe something like this, Except, for index reasons, again, it had better break at a Rabe chord of index zero. And a miracle of this geometry is that there are no such Rabe chords. So, uh, the only thing, it turns out, which can happen is um, that you get curves uh, down here and curves which are up here. And um, so what I learned is that the count of configurations like this is a boundary. In other words, its count is zero. But what does that zero mean? Uh, that, uh, where is that zero computed? A zero is computed in the skein. So um, I'm going to call the count of curves up here um, uh, uh, A. And I'm going to call the count of curves down here uh, phi. And A is an element in the skein of uh, this T2 times R. And phi is an element in the skein of the solid torus. And there's an action of this skein on this skein by stick the T2 on the outside of the solid torus. And what this zero means is that under this action, A phi equals zero. And phi is the thing I wanted to count. So it tells you that if I want to count phi, uh, I could instead compute A and then solve this equation. So let me compute A. So, so what is A? A is curves which go up to this kind of ray, uh, uh, Rabe chord here, and it turns out that I haven't told you yet what is that Lagrangian, so let me tell you now. If I have this S5, uh, I can take the map that takes to P2, and I can take the map from P2, uh, the moment map, okay? And uh, this Lagrangian 
is the, um, uh, this Legendrian at infinity is the one, the thing at infinity is the one that maps under this composition of maps to this point uh, in, under the moment map. So it's a, it's a two torus in P2, it's the Clifford torus, and then it's some, some multiple cover of that up here. But anyway, I can use this moment map to count those upstairs curves, it turns out, and uh, uh, there's three of them, that's it. That's the count. And that count is, if I write them in the skein, that count is one plus a longitude, uh, sorry, it's, it's unknot plus longitude plus meridian. And uh, I can ask, uh, can I solve the equation um, this uh, phi equals zero, psi equals zero, and the answer is yes. Um, and then, so, so you can solve. And you, uh, it's not difficult to solve because as I said, there's a basis which is diagonal under the action of the meridian. Uh, this thing acts by a scalar, and this one kind of is upper triangular in that basis. So for this reason, it's not difficult to solve, and the solution is uh, some, um, it's kind of, uh, um, it's kind of this kind of Wilson line with partition lambda, sum over all partitions, Wilson line partition lambda, there's some kind of, and then some kind of combinatorial factor. There's a product over boxes in the partition, Q to the C lambda, uh, Q to the minus uh, hook length. It's not important, this, this formula. I mean, it's, it's important, but it's not, uh, for, for this talk, it's not so important. Okay. Um, and, and that formula, uh, in some, uh, some appropriate sense, agrees with uh, these, previous, um, these previous calculations. But, but I get it in a bit different way. I get it by uh, deducing a priori some relation that the whole thing has to solve, and then solving the relation. I did not count any of those curves. So that maybe I'll do one, one last example. I mean, may, let, let me mention a fact which is relevant to the last example, which is that if I take this equation and I specialize it, so here I was using Homfley skein, I can specialize the U1 skein. U1 skein of T2 is quantum torus. And uh, this, is the, um, this is the polynomial representation of the quantum torus. And what this equation becomes in the quantum torus is the equation which defines the quantum dialogarithm. So, so this is some kind of fancy version of quantum dialogarithm. And that's relevant to the last example. Uh, okay. Example three. And this example three is related to the work, this kind of work of Gautam Wojnaitsky. and the work of Fan and Leitsky. And this is like in 2012, and this is like in 2019 or something. And let me just uh, uh, describe, since I'm maybe low on time, I'll just describe the relevant geometry. So uh, consider the following geometry. I begin with a Riemann surface, a sigma. And um, uh, I uh, consider um, uh, the geometry which is uh, sigma times, uh, I look at the cotangent bundle of sigma times r, okay? And I, so this is uh, sigma times r. And I fix a branched cover of sigma, so some uh, sigma tilde. And um, it, this branched cover has branch points, and I allow kind of two of these branch points to collide and then come apart in a different way, some sigma tilde prime. Um, and so, so this example is with some people, this is with some, some discussion, I learned this example last week. And so this is from discussions with Park, Alonghi, and Ekholm. And um, so, so I, I study this geometry. And so this is some kind of cover, okay, so some cover. And I take a knot uh, down, I take, I take a curve in sigma downstairs, a curve in sigma. And I, I take the co-normal to this curve, and then I move it very far away. This kind of, so this is kind of curve, C. And I count holomorphic curves going down from this uh, co-normal of this curve down to uh, this cover. 
Okay, and then there's two facts. Um, the fact one, this defines a map from the skein of sigma uh, in the variable um, a to the n to the skein of sigma tilde. Um, and the second fact, which may be more interesting, is that I could have done the same thing on this side. So I could have done it here, I could have done it here. So I have similar map, uh, skein of sigma a to the n to uh, skein of sigma. Uh, the, uh, sigma tilde from. And, and the map, again, the map is I take the curve, I take the conormal, I move it far away, and I count curves going down. It's obvious that it defines a map from curves to here. It's not obvious that it defines a map from the factors of the skein. But now, uh, observe the following thing. What I should have actually done is counted not just, I should have counted all curves in this geometry. And it turns out that in this geometry, when I have this thing of these points colliding and then kind of separating a different way, I learn the name of one holomorphic curve. So in this geometry, there's this holomorphic curve and one more. Okay? And this holomorphic curve is a disk, and its local geometry looks very much like this disk. And so its count is uh, psi, uh, this, 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 this psi in this game. So, so, so the, to the total multiple cover count of this curve is, again, psi, more or less by that calculation. So what I learn is that in, in the skein, in the skein of sigma uh, uh, tilde times r, I learn that, um, um, well, let's, let, 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 let's call this map f and this map f prime. Okay, so I, in the skein of sigma tilde times r, I learn that f, if I, if I have f of c times psi, by this way, uh, is the same as if I had moved this over here and counted on this side, is psi times f prime of c. And this, as I mentioned to you before, this psi, its, it's specialization, the u1 skein is q dot logarithm. And that means that this is a skein-valued cluster transformation. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there. Okay, let's thank Ma Vivek. <laughs> One question there. Thanks, uh, beautiful work. Uh, uh, the relation to skein relations and, and uh, the topological string. The way I interpret what you're showing is uh, Witten's Chern Simon's description a la topological A model, together with your argument, implies that you can get the skein relation which should satisfy for Humphrey. In other words, the target space interpretation of Chern Simon can also be deri uh, derived using the worksheet description. So that's the physics interpretation of what you have done. But let me comment on some of the questions you asked. So, uh, you were talking about the A, the skein relation A minus A inverse being Z times the circle there. Uh, and you said there's no N here. Actually, I want to say there is an N in your formula, but you probably didn't notice it, perhaps. You take one Lagrangian, and you do this operation, you get one factor. Suppose you have two of them, what happens in a sequence? Uh, the, the, num the number of them does not appear in this. No, no, but suppose you do the same oper operation you did. Go from yeah. uh, Riemann surface above and go two steps down pass through two Lagrangians, what happens to you? I should say that, that the may, may, maybe, maybe in this picture, um, may, indeed, some n appears here yeah. in this yeah. picture. That's right. So I'm trying to say that you have, in, in some sense, forgotten about the degeneracy of the log multiplicity of Lagrangian, and that's where it is. And the way it appears in physics is that that Lagrangian, so the, 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 the target space description of it, the way we understand it, which is related to the transitions we had with Gopal Kumar, the large and duality, is that the Lagrangian is a source of a, a unit of flux of Kähler form. In other words, the fact that there's a two cycle linking with the Lagrangian, each Lagrangian sources, the, jumps the Kähler form by G string times the string coupling constant in one unit for each Lagrangian. So if you have N of them, N units. 
I, I have a question for you. Why is it that this correction, or, or this fact, has never appeared when people in symplectic geometry study Fukaya category and so That's on? Ask them. I'm talking about the physics side. I see. You're, I see, you're okay. asking a physicist why math measures don't do something. That's not fair. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but the fair version of this question is how is it possible that they came up with a consistent theory without introducing this correction? Well, you, again, you should ask them. Okay, but okay. Uh, the, the description for us is clear. Uh, and the, the other question you asked was the uh, framing. How does it appear in physics? Actually, in the same paper that you're mentioning there with Mina, we discussed that. That had to do with the, so there are two ways you can see that in the physics. One is the UV divergences that you see in, 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 the, in the physics. But the way we got it was the boundary condition on field space. There's an ambiguity. And how you chose that ambiguity, the, basically the choice of the uh, uh, Lagrange, uh, P and Q variables in the quantum mechanics in a circle valued version gave you a choice, and your wave function will vary depending on that. The choice of boundary condition becomes the choice of the angle framing that you had. Can, can, can you turn that explicitly into vector field and four chain? It, it, you probably can, but I, we didn't have that language. The language for us was in the same description that we have in this paper. We talk about you have an action which is like u, d, v. With, so u and v are conjugate variables. And depending on which one you fix, or which combination of u and v you fix, you're choosing a framing. So there's an ambiguity about how you describe your, your wave function. Just, it's maybe an additional example. What you will get if x will be a compact Calabria threefold and l to be a Lagrangian torus, that's a fiber of a SYZ fibration. Do you get something there or? Oh, I would need to have such an exam, I mean, probably, I mean, we've discussed it before personally, yeah. but <laughs> I, I would have to first of all have some example where I could find this four chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're saying it's an example, it's not even clear how to get a four chain maybe. Maybe the four chain does not exist or? Yeah, I mean, uh -huh, it's I a see. homological condition uh -huh, about I whether see. it exists uh -huh, or not. I see. Yeah. Okay. First of all, thanks for the lovely talk. So your picture is definitely much more complete than physicists would have had in 1992 partly because that was before we understood that D-brains are actually physical objects in string theory, and Pachinsky hadn't yet discovered that D-brains carry Ramondramon charge. Well, one bit that was clear, and Vafa kind of said this, is that the parameters that I think you called Q and A correspond to what we would have called N and the string coupling constant. But a number of things in your story are not completely clear to me even now. So first let's discuss the four chain that's supposed to end on the Lagrangian. So, uh, I, I hope that that's a version of Polchinski saying that D-brains carry Ramon Ramon charge, discovered around 1995, which says that, um, as usually expressed by physicists, there's a two-form, D of which is the point gray dual of the Lagrangian. So your four-chain is the point gray dual of that two-form. Or maybe I should say better, the two-form could be point gray dual of your Lagrangian. So uh, I hope that's what your A, you called it A, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. I hope that that's what A means in physics, but there's something about I, the picture I don't understand. Maybe one of the physicists, physicists here does. Um, the D-brain with the source of Ramon-Ramon two-form field that would couple to a D-string, but for the rest of the picture leading to Sharon simons theory, we have fundamental strings, not D-strings. So I don't have a coherent understanding right now. and I don't know if any physicists here can... Tell me what's missing in what I'm saying. The deep in the topological strings, the role that the Ramon Ramon flux plays is played by Kähler form. That's what I was saying basically. So the Kähler form plays that same role. So that's the sources. So the Lagrangian is the singularity in the Kähler form. That's another way of saying it. It's a source. It sources the Kähler form. That with that you can derive, for example, the topological string. Large and duality we had with Gopal Kumar. It, it, you can derive the relation he's mentioning. It's just that statement. N not, there's no Ramon Ramon field because we're talking topological strings. So, the, so indeed, you can show that it's a source of a Kähler form in that, in that sense. It jumps the Kähler form. Let me try to answer Ed's uh, com uh, question maybe about this four chain. So in 1992, you explained that uh, 
in the A model, Lagrangian, the multiple Lagrangians carry Chin Simons theory. But uh, for Chin Simons to be well defined, you non perturbatively the level sh should be an integer, but you self explained that the string coupling constant is like 2 pi i over k plus n. And in this story, it's, it was a just formal parameter, it was not quantized. So then it means that we're dealing with some kind of analytic continuation of Chen Simons. But as you explained again, so that, that is actually four dimensional theory. So it's n equals four super immunes living on some four manifold whose boundary is the, the three manifold. So I think it's beginning of the story where there should be n equals, twisted n equals four living on this four chain. And so it just, so that's, that's my comment. Yeah. Can I have a comment on this? <laughs> Comments? So my interpretation of this four chain actually, I mean, we had, I had this four chain on compact color, but yeah, was related, and we call this the tadpole cancellation condition, right? The, you have to, first of all, it's a condition on the existence of the four chain, right? That this Lagrangian has to be homologically trivial. And that can be interpreted in terms of what Edward said in the space time. To get the Ramon Ramon interpretation, you need to go to the superstring in the, um, and then you, you, you have an interpretation of this uh, local cancellation of this Ramon Ramon charge on the two dimensional defect in the um, Ugori Wafa setup. And I think in the topological string, it should also be a type of tadpole cancellation, which has to do with the decoupling of the, of the B model from, uh, from the A model. So, so we had an interpretation of this four chain in, uh, in compact Calabiao case. Yeah. Other comments, questions? I think in, like in a lot of applications in symplectic geometry, people really want um, numbers for some of these counts. Is there a way to kind of recover some numerical counts for like a particular perturbation or something from the skein theoretic counts that works in practice? Oh, if you have something in the skein, like what is the skein? Skein is the thing you can feed the turn Simons. So if we did the turn Simons, it'll give you a number. Oh, yeah. I just want to put the first name of this guy, which I have written in my, uh, because he, he, he's a young guy. Um, Uh, Sung Hyuk Park. Okay, so we can thank uh, Vivek again. <laughs> and uh, uh, please uh, wait uh, for a moment. There should be an announcement right now. No, Francesco? <laughs>